Wow. <laughs> well, this is really fantastic. Uh, you're here tonight for the, for the very first uh, lecture series we're titling In Pursuit of Cultural Freedom. And And I can assure you this is just the first one. There'll be many more, particularly with this uh, reaction of the people of Santa Fe. This is just very exciting for us. And this, we're going to continue to do the readings and conversations, so that's a separate package. Um, I just want to mention some of the issues we're going to try and touch on. Uh, income distribution, economics in general, but income distribution in the United States. Labor rights, <laughs> women's issues, women's rights, climate change, civil liberties and civil rights, the militarization of our foreign policy, educational issues, racism and xenophobia, and immigration. And I'm sure there are others. I, I just made those notes before I put on my glasses and I can hardly read them. Heard me? Immigration, I, I mentioned that, yeah. Um, are, are, we have two lectures scheduled after this. One is Maria Hinosa uh, from Latino USA, who will be here on a Monday the 4th of April with Mary Charlotte. And on April 2nd, uh, May 24th, uh, Michael Ratner, the attorney and president of the Center for Constitutional Rights. <laughs> He'll also be with Mary Charlotte. Um, Glenn Greenwald is going to be well introduced by David Barsamian, but I wanted to say about David um, that he's been producing alternative radio, which is carried on KS, KUNM and many, many public stations for 25 years. He's a, he's a really, um, he's an, a, a journalist and, and progressive intellectual who's probably interviewed more progressive intellectuals than anybody else in America. And uh, so we're very honored that he agreed to come and be the host of this evening. And again, thank you, all of you. You're really great. It's wonderful you're here. Here's David. Thank you. Yo! Hey, muy buenas tardes, bienvenidos. Que viva de la Internacional de las Mujeres. Today is International Women's Day. Arriba! Well, it's wonderful to be here and to be part of this uh, exciting new series. Many thanks to the Lannan Foundation. Uh, just a couple of um, housekeeping notes uh, after uh, Glenn uh, Greenwald's presentation. There'll be a brief intermission and then there'll be uh, dialogue and, and audience questions. And then there'll be a book signing uh, uh, at the very end in the, in the lobby. What is justice? Is it another commodity in the marketplace to be packaged and sold to the highest bidder? These are not idle questions, but go to the core of who we are and the nature of our society. And I want to read from the introduction to um, Glenn Greenwald's forthcoming book, With Liberty and Justice for Some. <laughs> kind of gives it away, doesn't he? The central principle of America's founding, the ultimate guardian of justice, would be the rule of law. Vast inequality in every other realm was considered inevitable, inev inevitable and even desirable. Some would be rich and many would be poor. The American conception of liberty was not only consistent with but premised on the inevitability of outcome inequality. The one exception was the law. Under the law, no inequality was tolerable. Law was understood to be the political sine qua non ensuring fairness, a level playing field, and a universal set of rules. It was the non-negotiable 
prerequisite that made all other forms of inequality acceptable. Only if everyone was bound in the same rules would outcome inequality be justifiable. So central is this founding principle that most Americans absorb it by osmosis via, via numerous cliches we're all familiar with, all are equal before the law, justice is blind, no one is above the law, etc. We are, in the words of John Adams, a nation of laws, not men and women, he should have added. And this was an insurance against the tyranny that American colonists had launched a revolution to abolish. For that reason, American political liberty was always bound to the notion of the supremacy of law over men. Then Greenwald adds, that central promise of the American founding equality before the law has been abandoned. And from the investigation and harassment of peace activists in the Midwest, um, all the way to India, where Arundhati Roy is being threatened with sedition because of her outspoken political dissent, uh, we are finding uh, numerous examples of the state clamping down on freedom of speech and flaunting the very notion of equality under law. We have now the case right in front of us of Bradley Manning, who, in my view, uh, should be a candidate for the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> and maybe a, a Lannan Award for cultural freedom. <laughs> now, you know, you see Eric Holder, Obama's uh, Attorney General, you know, very piously and virtuously denounce uh, Bradley Manning for what he has done, leaking, uh, he has not been convicted of anything, incidentally, and has been being held now for nine months in solitary confinement, 23 hours a day, uh, with very little access to uh, any other, you know, contact, and uh, now, most recently, it's been reported that he has been uh, stripped of his clothing as well. Does that echo Abu Ghraib or the founding principles of American uh, democracy? Uh, there's very good evidence that the WikiLeaks documents, and again, Holder has been very virtuous in denouncing Julian Assange, and he, he promised to you know, look for any legal avenue to bring Assange uh, to justice, the, the uh, WikiLeaks uh, man. And so you have, you know, aiding the enemy. Who is the enemy in this case? The enemy is us, the American public, because we and the people of the world have benefited from the release of these documents. So I think this issue of uh, Bradley Manning and uh, uh, Julian Assange and WikiLeaks uh, goes to the very core principles of democracy and who we are as a society. And just today, or just yesterday, uh, Obama announced that military tribunals will be resumed uh, at Guantanamo. Uh, you'll remember his campaign promise to uh, eliminate, to close down Guantanamo, promise forgotten, and we move on. Turn the page, as Obama said, uh, on Iraq in one of his most infamous uh, speeches, completely forgetting uh, international law and accountability. So just as a generation before, when Johnson and McNamara and Rusk and the others went scot-free for their war crimes, this group, Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld, et al., are also getting a free pass. This cannot stand. The lack of accountability tears to shreds the very idea of justice. It makes a mockery of our Constitution. So without further ado, um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Glenn Green Greenwald, give him a warm Santa Fe welcome. Thanks, Glenn. Thank you. Thanks very much.
And good evening to everybody, and, and thank you for coming, and, and thank you for that very warm reception. And thank you as well to the Lannan Foundation for inviting me to Santa Fe, which I've discovered over the course of the last day and a half is a beautiful city. It's my first time here. Um, and I'm especially delighted to have been invited to kick off what certainly will be a very exciting and vibrant uh, speaker series that the Lannan Foundation is sponsoring. So I'm, I'm particularly pleased to be here for that as well. I've, I've been speaking more at uh, events like this and uh, at various college campuses and the like over the last year. And one of the things that typically happens before the event um, is that there's a lot of time and mental energy spent on figuring out what the topic of the speech is going to be and what the title is going to be. And uh, the speaker and the sponsors of the event go back and forth over what will be an interesting topic, what's timely, what will be interesting to people. And then the title gets worked on and changed and edited. And um, I have several speeches planned over the next course of, of the month. And there's all different topics and titles that were all worked out as part of this arduous process. And what I found is that as much time and energy is spent on that process, it actually ends up being completely irrelevant. Because I find that no matter what the topic is, I keep speaking about the same set of issues no matter what the title is. And the reason why that happens is not because I have some monomaniacal obsession with a handful of issues that I just can't pry myself away from no matter what the topic is. That may be true, but that, that's not actually the reason. The reason is because political controversies and political uh, issues never take place in isolation. They're always part of some broader framework that drives political outcomes and that determines how political power is exercised. And so it doesn't really matter which specific topic or which specific controversy of the day you want to discuss. The reality is you can't really meaningfully discuss any of them without examining all of the forces that shape political, or political culture and that shape how political outcomes are determined. And so in order to talk about any issue, you end up speaking about these same broad themes um, that are shaping and I think plaguing um, the political discourse in the United States. This is something that I first realized um, when I started writing about politics in late 2005. And one of the very first topics on which I focused was the scandal involving the Bush administration's eavesdropping on American citizens without the warrants required by law. And this was first exposed by the New York Times in December of 2005, so it actually happened around six weeks after I started writing about politics. And I had this, back then, very naive idea that this was going to be a fairly straightforward and simple political controversy. And the reason I thought that in my naivete was because what the Bush administration got caught doing, eavesdropping on Americans without warrants from the, from the FISA court, is as clear as could possibly be a felony under American law. Like, you can actually look at the criminal law that existed since 1978 when FISA was enacted, and it says that doing exactly what the Bush administration got caught doing is a felony in the United States, just like robbing a bank or um, extortion or murder, um, and that it's punishable by a prison term of five years or a $10,000 fine for each offense. And the report that the New York Times published was that there were at least hundreds and probably thousands of instances where American citizens were eavesdropped on illegally and, without the, and in violation of the law. So I thought that this was going to be a fairly straightforward controversy because I had this idea that if you get caught committing a felony and the New York Times writes and reports on that and everybody is talking about that, that that's actually going to be a really bad thing for the person who got caught doing that. <laughs> I know it was really naive. I'm actually embarrassed to admit that I thought that, but that really is what I thought at the time. And I also thought that basically everybody would be in agreement that that was a really bad thing to do, that thing that the law said for 30 years is a felony punishable by a prison term and, and, a, and a large fine. And as it turned out, and I realized this fairly quickly, none of that actually happened. Um, it wasn't a really bad thing for the people who got caught committing that felony. And not only did, not, did everybody not agree that that was a bad thing, very few people actually agree that that was a very bad thing. 
And so in order for me to, what I thought that I was going to be able to do was just to take this issue and write very legalistically about it and demonstrate that what the Bush administration had done was a crime, that it was a felony under the statute, and that the legal defenses for it that they had raised were frivolous and baseless, and that would be the end of the story. Crime committed, investigation commenced, punishment ensues. Um, and so what immediately happened was when I realized that none of that was really going on, of course, then the question became why. Why was my expectation about what would happen so radically different than what in fact happened? And so then I needed to delve into that dynamic that I began by referencing that d determines political outcomes. So I had to examine the fact that we have a political faction in the United States, the American right, that is drowning in concepts of nationalism and exceptionalism in tribalism that leads them to believe that whatever they and their leaders do is justifiable inherently because they do it. Um, and in a complete lack of principle, this is the same faction that impeached a democratically elected president not more than 10 years earlier on the ground that the rule of law is paramount and we can't allow our presidents to break the law, um, and yet here they were defending it. And then I watched Democratic politicians, one after the next, go on talk shows to talk about this scandal, and they were all petrified of saying what the reality was, which was that what the Bush administration got caught doing was a crime and it was illegal. They were all afraid to say that. And what they were really eager for was for the scandal to go away, for them not to have to talk about it any longer. And so that made me then start writing about the craveness of the Democratic Party and the extent to which they're replicas of Republicans when it comes to national security issues and the complete bipartisan consensus where all of these kind of issues are concerned, especially in the post 9-11 world. And then I started realizing that there were journalists who were shaping the political discourse who were not only saying that they were, taught, they were fine with the fact that the Bush administration had broken the law, but were attacking the very few Democrats who actually stood up and said, I think it's problematic when the president does things that the Congress says is a criminal offense. And the journalist class almost unanimously um, was saying that the Democrats ought to avoid this for political reasons and that on substantive grounds, Bush did the right thing because he had to protect us. Um, and then I had to start writing about the media's allegiance to political power and their belief in the omnipotence of the national security state and its ability to act without restraints. And then it turned out that it wasn't just the government who was eavesdropping, but they were doing so in co collaboration with the largest telecoms, the entire telecom industry in, a sen in essence, which was turning over all of the phone records and emails of their customers secretly to the government, even though laws were in place specifically prohibiting telecoms, private telecoms, from handing over any information to the government without warrants because in the past, when the church committee discovered the decades of abuses, they found that AT&T had been turning over records to the government, that Western Union was turning over all telegraphs. And so the Congress said, not only the government is barred from eavesdropping on Americans without warrants, but to private telecoms, it shall be against the law for them to turn over data without warrants as well. And of course, they did exactly that. And that led to my having to write about the consortium between government and corporate power and how the surveillance state and the national security state have essentially become merged and that the real power lies with the private sector because so many of these government functions have been nationalized. And then, of course, the entire quote-unquote scandal ended by all of the perpetrators being completely protected. The Bush administration was given an immunity shield by the Obama administration from any investigations to determine whether crimes were committed. And the private telecom industry was given a retroactive immunity by the Democratic-led Congress in 2008, supported by Barack Obama. In fact, the only person to suffer any legal repercussions from that NSA scandal was someone named Thomas Tam, who was the mid-level Justice Department whistleblower who found out that this was taking place and was horrified by it and called Eric Lichtblau at the New York Times and exposed that it had happened. The person who was the only one to suffer repercussions was the person who exposed the criminality. The criminals were fully immunized. And so that led to my having to write about how the rule of law had been subverted, all the things that David was just reading about. And so I realized that what I thought was the scandal was about, what I thought the issue was about, you know, nice, abstract, clinical little discussions of whether the law had been violated and whether Article 2 theories were really um, viable 
were actually relatively irrelevant. You could have that discussion, but it didn't make much of a difference. What made the real difference were these broader themes. And so, although the topic tonight is ostensibly WikiLeaks and the controversy surrounding WikiLeaks, if you look at what has happened in the WikiLeaks scandal, it involves every one of the ingredients that I just described. Um, and so that's why I could give a speech on the erosion of civil liberties in the United States, which I'm going to do in a few days. Um, tonight I'm talking about WikiLeaks, but what I'm always going to end up talking about are the fundamentals of how political power in the United States is exercised and the way in which just outcomes are subverted because of these dynamics. And, and one of the reasons why I find WikiLeaks to be such a fascinating and critical topic is because I think it sheds unprecedented light on how these processes work and how they have come to develop and evolve in the United States. And I also think that there's so much at stake in the war that has arisen over WikiLeaks and internet freedom and the ability to breach the secrecy regime behind which the government operates, um, that for that reason too, it's such a critical topic. So there are a lot of different ways to talk about WikiLeaks. So, and, and WikiLeaks is a complex topic, but one of the things I want to do is just to sort of walk through a little bit the chronology of my involvement in WikiLeaks and talk about some of the realizations that I've had that may have been somewhat known to me, but have really been cast into a very bright light as a result of what's happened um, in the controversy surrounding WikiLeaks. So, the first time that I ever wrote about WikiLeaks, or really ever thought about WikiLeaks, was in January of 2010, a little bit more than a year ago now. And this was before almost no, this is at a time almost nobody had even heard of WikiLeaks. It was before they disclosed the first really newsmaking um, leak, which was the video of the Apache helicopters shooting unarmed civilians and journalists in Baghdad. Um, but what had prompted me to pay attention to it and to write about it was that the Pentagon had prepared a report in 2008, a classified report about WikiLeaks that ironically, though unsurprisingly, was leaked to WikiLeaks, <laughs> which WikiLeaks then published. And what this report said, it talked about how the, the Pentagon considered WikiLeaks to be an enemy of the state, a grave threat to United, state, to United States national security, and it discussed a variety of ways to destroy WikiLeaks by fabricating documents to submit to them in the hopes that they would publish forged documents which would then destroy their credibility like what happened with Dan Rather and CBS News in the Bush AWOL story. Um, it talked about breaching the confidentiality between them and their sources so that their sources would get exposed and people would no longer feel confident in leaking to them. And I didn't really have a very good sense for what WikiLeaks had been doing or what it was, but I figured that if there's any group being targeted that way by the Pentagon, that's a group that merits a lot more examination and probably some admiration. And so I started <laughs> looking a lot into WikiLeaks and what they were doing. And um, you know, at the time, although they hadn't made much news in the United States, they had actually exposed a great deal of wrongdoing around the world. They had disclosed documents showing the involvement of government leaders and death squads in Kenya. Um, they had shown the involvement of the Icelandic government in the financial collapse that destroyed that country's financial security. There was an internet bill being discussed in Australia to shut down websites that um, supposedly were promoting child pornography, and yet secretly on the list of targeted websites were a bunch of political sites that had been critical of the Australian government. They had exposed corporate um, toxic waste dumping in West Africa, the involvement of uh, or the negligence of local uh, officials in Berlin um, with regard to a, a trampling at a nightclub that killed 23 people. So they had been quite active in a whole variety of different ways in exposing wrongdoing. And the one document that they had exposed involving the United States was a manual at Guantanamo for how prisoners ought to be treated. And this manual was nothing very enlightening. We already knew that severe systematic abuse and torture were taking place at, um, the, at that site. But the mere fact that WikiLeaks had shown that they were able to start shedding light on some of the world's most powerful factions and exposing serious corruption, and had touched a little bit on American, America's detention regime with this one document was enough for the Pentagon to take them very seriously. And so I wrote at the time about that report, and I had talked about the, all the potential for good 
that I thought WikiLeaks could do. And I had encouraged in the context of my writing about it, I also interviewed Julian Assange at the time, I encouraged my readers to donate money to the group because there were indications that they were somewhat impeded in uh, some of the disclosures they wanted to do because of a lack of resources. And I said, this would be a great organization to donate your money to. They need it. They're, they look as though they could really achieve a lot of good. And after I wrote that, I received a lot of comments from people via email, people in person telling me this when I attended events, people writing in my comment section, American citizens who said the following, I understand and agree with the idea that WikiLeaks has a lot of potential to do good, but I'm actually afraid of donating money because I'm afraid that I'm going to end up on some kind of a list somewhere or that eventually I will be charged with aiding and abetting or giving material support to a terrorist group. And this was not, you know, one or two people who tended toward the pole of paranoia saying these things. These were very rational people, um, and there were a lot of them. You know, some readers, long-term readers, who I, I knew to be quite sober in their thinking. The fear that they were expressing was somewhat pervasive. And that, to me, was extraordinarily striking, that these were American citizens who were afraid to donate money to a group whose political aims they supported who had never been charged with, let alone convicted of, any crime, who felt like they were going to end up on some government list or possibly be charged with aiding and abetting or giving material support to terrorism. And although I didn't find those fears to be completely justifiable in the sense that I thought that those things would happen, I told people that I thought that they ought to set those fears aside and, and, and donate money anyway, the fact that those fears existed that that kind of climate of intimidation had been created in the United States when it comes to the most basic rights of association and free speech, which are, what those, which are the rights that are implicated by donating money to a political organization whom you support, that, those, that that fear and that climate of intimidation had been so great that people were self-censoring and, 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 and relinquishing their own rights was something that perhaps in the abstract I had known about in the past, but really illustrated to me just how pervasive that had become. And then over the course of the next several months, I, because I was writing about WikiLeaks more and more, especially as they began releasing the newsmaking videos and documents about the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, and I began engaging in debates on behalf of WikiLeaks and arguing with those who were claiming they were a force for evil and should be punished and prosecuted, I got to know a lot of the people who had been involved in WikiLeaks, either currently or in the past. And especially among the people who had once worked with WikiLeaks but then stopped, there was a common theme that they all sounded when you spoke to them about why they stopped working with WikiLeaks, including some who had been very high up in the organization's hierarchy and who were well-resourced and people who, who are citizens of European countries. What they said almost to a person about why they stopped being involved in WikiLeaks and what a lot of people who still work with WikiLeaks will tell you about why they're contemplating no longer working with WikiLeaks is they will say, I am extremely supportive of the organization's aims and mission. I am proud to have been a part of the things that they have done thus far. But I have a paralyzing fear that one day my government is going to knock on my door and not charge me with a crime that I can confront and am willing to deal with. But they're going to knock on my door and tell me that they are extraditing me to the United States. In other words, the great fear of almost every person now or previously involved in WikiLeaks is that they're going to end up in the custody of the American justice system because of the black hole of due process free punishment that they've seen created and that is sustained for foreign nationals accused of harming the uh, United States national security because of the way in which people are disappeared without recourse to courts or any political protest. It's amazing that we have spent decades, probably since the end of World War II, lavishing praise on ourselves as the model of justice for the entire world, the leaders of the free world, lecturing everybody else about what their system of justice ought to be, and yet the fear that so many people around the world have is that they will end up in the grips of American justice. And that, to me, was um, extraordinarily telling as well.
Then over the course of the next couple months, when the controversy over WikiLeaks was really escalated by the release of the diplomatic cables, um, I began doing a lot of public media debates over whether WikiLeaks is a force for good or a force for evil or whatever the media morality narrative was and how that was framed. And I appeared on countless shows and television networks. Um, and the reason I was so ubiquitous doing that isn't because CNN and MSNBC, MSNBC producers suddenly decided that they really liked me. It was because there were so few people to choose from who were actually defending WikiLeaks because the unanimity um, in the media was essentially that they were um, demonic and ought to be punished. And so in order to have a debate where one person was arguing on behalf of WikiLeaks and one was arguing against it, it was very easy to find people who were against it. You could pretty much pick a journalist or a political official out of the hat and that would be accomplished. What was hard was to find people who were willing to defend it. There were some, there were a few, but not many. And so I did a lot of these shows, a lot more than I like to do and, and is probably healthy for me to do. And one of the things that I found that was so striking was I was usually on the show, the, the format of the show would be there would be some journalist or a person who is on TV, an actor on TV playing the role of a journalist, <laughs> along with, that's usually actually what it was, it, along with some kind of government official, some like Washington um, functionary. Um, so I was on CNN and I uh, debated Jessica Yellen, who's the CNN anchor, along with Fran Townsend, George Bush's former national security advisor. And I did an NPR show once with Jamie Rubin, who was Madeleine Albright's deputy, and John Burns, the New York Times reporter. That was usually the format. Um, I did MSNBC with Jonathan Capert, who's a journalist who writes for the Washington Post editorial page, and Susan Molinari, a Republican, former Republican congresswoman. And literally in every single case, the, the, the person who was designated the journalist and the person who was there to represent America's political class thought and argued identically. I mean, they were completely indistinguishable in terms of how they thought about WikiLeaks. They were all in agreement that what WikiLeaks was doing was awful, that our government had to put a stop to it. The only concern that they had was that the government wasn't more careful in safeguarding secrets. So you had people who were claiming to be journalists who were on television outraged that they were learning what the government was doing and furious at the government for not taking better steps to hide those things from them. Um, and so, and, and you had these debates that would take place and I would be listening to them and I literally couldn't tell the journalist from the political official apart. And the reason that was so striking to me was because if you think about it, you know, if you put yourself in the mindset of what a journalist is supposed to be, not what an American journalist is, what an American journalist is supposed to be, what they're supposed to be interested in is exposing the secrets of the powerful, especially when the actions that are being undertaken in secret are corrupt or illegal or deceitful. And what WikiLeaks is doing is exactly that. It is shedding unprecedented light on what the world's most powerful corporate and government factions are doing. And so any journalist who just ever had an inkling of the journalistic spirit at one point in their life before that all got suffocated, you would think that they would look at what WikiLeaks was doing and just reflexively celebrate it. Or at least, at the very least, see the good in it. Yes, that what they're doing is what we are supposed to be doing, which is bringing to the citizens of the world the secrets that governments and corporations are trying to keep to conceal their improper actions, and yet there was almost none of that. I mean, it made sense to me that people in the political class were furious at WikiLeaks because people in the political class inherently see their own prerogatives as being worth preserving. And they want to be able to operate in secret and think that they ought to be. But the fact that journalists were not only on board with that, but were really leading the way was really remarkable to me as I did these um, interviews because there wasn't really even a pretense of separation between how journalists think and how political functionaries think. Um, and I, I found that pretty, pretty striking as well. Um, a few you know, other aspects to WikiLeaks, to the WikiLeaks controversy that um, I think are commonalities in um, how our political discourse functions. One of the things that you had was almost a full and complete bipartisan consensus that WikiLeaks was satanic. I mean, I don't think 
there has been a single Democratic or Republican politician of any national notoriety other than, I think, Ron Paul and a couple of um, very liberal members of the House who were willing to say that maybe WikiLeaks is an all evil in a very cautious way. Other than that, you basically had a complete consensus, as always happens, when it comes to national security controversies. Almost nobody was willing to defend WikiLeaks. Then what you had was a faction on the American right that, and, and some Democrats as well, who very casually, almost like you would advocate you know, a change in the capital gains tax or um, some added safeguards for environmental protections, um, would go on television, they would start calling for Julian Assange's death. Like, I think we need to send drone attacks. Um, I think we need to treat him the way that Al-Qaeda is treated. Um, and, and maybe I was being a little unfair to Democrats. I mean, I guess one of the debates that Republicans and Democrats were having at this time was, should we kill Julian Assange or just throw him in prison for the rest of his life, even though he hasn't actually committed any discernible crime? But the ease and the casualness with which our political culture entails calls for people's death. You know, we ought to kill this person, even without any due process, we ought to use drones, we ought to um, treat him the way we treat Al-Qaeda and the like, um, I think is also reflective of how our political culture functions. A couple other things that happen that I think are quite common and, and shed light, WikiLeaks sheds light on. Um, one of the things that started happening was you have members of Congress and both parties writing laws now to vest the government with greater power to prosecute people for espionage and for other serious felony offenses for leaking classified information. So this is very typical when a new demon arises, and here we have Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, the villain of the month. Immediately the government starts thinking about how they can opportunistically manipulate the hatred, the two-minute hate sessions that arise over this new villain to develop and seize more power for itself. And you very much see that. And the last point um, that happened um, that is, I think, quite significant is, and this is what David was talking about in his introduction, was the complete manipulation of law to advance the interests of the powerful. Um, one of the things that I found most striking about what has happened with WikiLeaks is there's this group, Anonymous is the name of what they call themselves, and they're essentially a group of mostly adolescent hackers who have quite advanced computer skills for doing things like shutting down websites or slowing them down. And what they decided that they were going to do is that they were going to take a position in defense of WikiLeaks. And they said that they were going to target for cyber attacks and other kinds of um, cyber warfare any companies that, in response to the government's pressure, terminated their services with WikiLeaks. And there were a whole variety of companies that obediently uh, complied with the government's request to cut off all services with WikiLeaks, PayPal, um, MasterCard, Visa, Amazon. All of these companies made it impossible for WikiLeaks to stay online or for them to um, conduct financial transactions, receive donations. And so Anonymous began targeting these websites. And the attacks were fairly primitive. They slowed those sites down for a few hours. Um, not very much damage. And yet the Justice Department treated them like this was Pearl Harbor on the internet. Eric Holder said, we are going to devote unlimited resources to getting to the bottom of Anonymous and who they are. And they were turned out to be a couple of 16-year-olds in the Netherlands and Belgium, um, you know, doing the cliched operating from their mother's basement type thing. But the fact that they had targeted corporate power on behalf of WikiLeaks, an enemy of the United States government, meant that the full force of the law was unleashed in order to punish them. But a couple of weeks before those anonymous attacks, there was a far more sophisticated and a far more serious and dangerous cyber attack that was launched at WikiLeaks that basically resulted in their being removed from the entire network of websites for the United States. The company, the entire network that, that hosts all internet websites for the United States could no longer sustain those attacks that were being launched in a way that would safeguard their other customers. And they basically removed WikiLeaks from the internet. And that was when they had to search around and ultimately find a different URL. Now that attack 
was really worthy of serious investigation because the complexity of the attack was really unlike thing, uh, anything that had really been seen before in terms of being right out in the open. And yet, so far, for some really strange reason, even though that attack was every bit as illegal as the attacks that Anonymous had launched that merited such scrutiny and investigation from the Justice Department, Eric Holder, the Justice Department, the Obama administration, has never once vowed to get to the bottom of who might be responsible for the attacks that knocked WikiLeaks offline, even though they're much more dangerous. And so what this really reflects is that the law becomes a weapon for the United States government, for corporate power to use to punish those who stand up to it the way that Anonymous did in a very mild and, and modest way. Um, and yet at the same time, the law shields those who are in power or who are operating on behalf of those in power or to advance their interests as illustrated by the fact that whoever was responsible for the attack on WikiLeaks, whether a government organization or a corporate entity or some combination of both, broke serious laws, committed serious cyber felonies, and yet will never be investigated, let alone prosecuted by the Justice Department. And all of these ingredients that I've just described that WikiLeaks reveals and that has shaped the outcome uh, and, and driven the WikiLeaks controversy are the same things that I would talk about no matter what political controversy you ask me to talk about, whether it be civil liberties erosions or what's happening in Wisconsin or anything else. And that's why I say that the title, the topic, the individual episode that you choose to focus on is valuable only as a window into how our political culture, how political factions all function. So the last point I want to make um, is why I think that, that WikiLeaks is such a vital topic, not just in terms of the light that it shines on our political process, but in terms of what's at stake. And I actually do believe that the battle over WikiLeaks will easily be one of the most politically consequential conflicts of our generation, if not the most politically consequential. And I think that we're only at the very incipient stages of this conflict, and that how it plays out is very much still to be determined. But I think what's at stake is whether or not the secrecy regime that is the linchpin for how the American government functions will continue to be invulnerable and impenetrable, or whether it will start to be meaningfully breached. And I also think that internet freedom, the ability to use the internet for what has always been its ultimate promise, which is to have citizens band together in a way that no longer needs large corporate and institutional resources to subvert and undermine the most powerful factions to provide a counterweight to them, whether that internet freedom will be preserved. And this is why I think that. You know, we have, if in general, when you talk about politics, when you listen to political discussions, what typically is focused on are these internecine, day-to-day -day conflicts that are partisan in nature. What are Republicans and Democrats bickering about? What reason today is the left and the right at one another's throat? What is it that's dividing the citizenry and making the citizenry divisive and unable to band together to defend their common interests? These are the kinds of controversies that fill cable news shows, that occupy pundits and political chatterers and, and all of that. And by and large, all of that is completely inconsequential. In fact, I shouldn't say that. It actually is consequential. It has a purpose. The purpose is to distract all of us from what really it matters in terms of how the government functions. And what matters in terms of how the government functions has very little to do with whether Democrats or Republicans win the last election or the next election. And it has very little to do with who sits in the White House, what individual occupies the Oval Office. I don't mean to suggest those things are irrelevant. They're not. They matter in, in, in marginal and, and sometimes more ways. Um, but what they don't have anything to do with is the permanent power faction that runs the United States and runs the governments with which the United States is allied. And it's this consortium of government and corporate power that I talked about earlier. And what's really interesting is, you know, it used to be the case that if you stood up in front of an audience and said that what really is running 
the government of the United States is not the political parties that win elections, but this secret consortium of government and corporate power. A lot of people would look at you like you were just, you know, some kind of fringe, paranoid maniac. It would be a self-marginalizing act to talk about that. But I don't actually think that's the case very much longer, and that's because a lot of mainstream sources now have confronted those realities because it's impossible to turn away from them. I mean, you can, of course, go back to the famous 1956 farewell speech of Dwight Eisenhower, who is hardly a fringe figure. He was a four-star, five-star general and a two-term elected Republican president, and he warned about exactly that. And he called it the military-industrial complex, of course, but he described how the merger of government and corporate power in the national security state context was threatening to subvert democracy because it would become vastly more powerful and unaccountable than anything that was actually still responsive to democratic forces. And yet it's odd that something that someone like Dwight Eisenhower warned about became for a long time taboo to talk about. Um, and yet I think in the post 9-11 world, this merger has become so overt, so conspicuous, so pervasive that it's impossible to hide it any longer. And so earlier this year, or rather at the, the end of last year, the Washington Post had a three-part series that got very little attention because it covered this topic too well and people just didn't quite know how to process it, especially people who go on television and talk about the news of the day, but it was called Top Secret America. And it was written by Dana Priest, who's one of the most widely hailed and highly decorated um, establishment reporters, um, along with William Arkin. And what it described is exactly what I just described, which is this vast apparatus of corporate and government power that is so unaccountable and so secret and so sprawling and so powerful that not even the people ostensibly running it know what it is composed of or what it does or what it entails. And this is the faction that is truly exerting the power in the United States when it comes to most of the significant policies. And so people get confused and frustrated and angry and confounded and disheartened when they elect a Democratic president like Barack Obama who ran on a platform of change and then delivered so little of it and who continues to extend and bolster the very policies against which he railed while he was running. And there's lots of reasons why that is. And part of it is because politicians are inherently unprincipled and get into office and want to preserve their own power. They think that the power that other people exercise, which was a threat in their hands, is not only something that can be trusted but can be used as a force for good. All of those reasons are true, but what is really true is that this powerful faction that exists, this enormous consortium of government and corporate power, is at least as powerful and probably much more so than any single politician, even the most powerful man on earth, or whatever we call the president these days. And so even if he wanted to change these things, and I think he doesn't, even if he wanted to, he probably couldn't. And what this faction relies upon more than anything else to preserve their power and to carry out the actions that they undertake is this wall of secrecy, this regime of secrecy. It is that secrecy that enables them to operate in the dark and therefore operate without any constraints, moral, ethical, legal, or any other kind. And this is not a new concept. If you look at what political theorists have always talked about for centuries, what you look, if you look at what the founders talked about, the gravest threat to democracy and to a healthy government is excessive secrecy because people are human beings and human nature is such that if you operate in the dark, you will start to abuse your power. And that's why central to the whole design of our country was that there would be these institutions that would prevent that from happening. They would be adversarial to political power. We would have the Congress that would investigate and exert oversight. We would have the media, the glorious fourth estate that would serve as a bulwark against abuse. We would have the courts that would ultimately hold people accountable under the constraints of law, at least, if nothing else worked. And each of these institutions have utterly failed, especially, though not only, but especially in the post-9-11 world, to bring about any meaningful transparency to what the national security and the surveillance state is doing. They operate fully without accountability, without constraint, and with total compunction to do what they want. And so WikiLeaks is one of the very, very, very few entities that has proven itself capable of breaching that wall of secrecy, 
That is why it is one of the very few entities that has finally put some degree of meaningful fear in the heart of this national security state. And for that reason, and that reason alone, and it's all I need, that is why I think a defense of WikiLeaks has become so vital and so crucial and such an obligation on the part of anybody who believes that this regime of secrecy is so, is so harmful. Now, if you look at the instances of serious government abuse over the past decade and even longer, what you'll find is that the linchpin, the enabler for all of them was secrecy. So if you look at the Bush administration's creation of a worldwide torture regime, or it's spying on American citizens without the warrants required by law, or Dick Cheney meeting with energy executives early on to formulate the nation's energy policies to benefit only that group, or how the government excluded any dissenting intelligence on the lead up to the Iraq war to make the case as though it was somehow um, airtight, or even going back to Vietnam when the government knew that the war they were waging was unwinnable, even as they were assuring the American public that they were making progress, and then Daniel Ellsberg released the secret documents showing that it's always secrecy that enables this level of abuse. It's the same thing in all of the animal kingdom. Cockroaches at night scamper around in the kitchen and the minute you turn on the light, they run and hide. That is what transparency and light does to people. And, you know, so the, and one of the things about it is there, you can have whistleblowers and we have had whistleblowers without WikiLeaks. But there's a couple of features to WikiLeaks that make it so unique and such a threat. One of the unique features is that it provides full anonymity. It doesn't even know the identity of the people who are leaking to it. Unlike, say, the New York Times, which always knows the identity of their sources and thus can be compelled at some point to disclose it to the government, and they have been compelled to do so, WikiLeaks does not know the identity of who it is who's leaking to them. And so unless somebody goes around and boasts that they are the leaker, it's virtually impossible for the government, no matter how much force they bring to bear, to discover the identity. More importantly, WikiLeaks is a stateless organization. So unlike the New York Times or the Washington Post or the Guardian or Der Spiegel or El Pais or any other newspapers around the world, WikiLeaks does not physically exist in any state and therefore can't be subject to the laws of that state and can't be therefore compelled, dragged into court and compelled to disclose information about their sources even if they had it. But what's more important still about this statelessness is that unlike American newspapers, which will acknowledge, as Bill Keller, the executive editor of the New York Times recently did in an article that he wrote about WikiLeaks, they will acknowledge that even though they try to be objective, their allegiance is a patriotic and nationalistic one. They are loyal to the US government and their editorial judgments are shaped by what advances or undermines American interests and they therefore don't disclose things many times on the ground that disclosure will harm American policy, even though that policy is improper. So the New York Times learned that the Bush administration was spying without warrants, and they sat on that story for a year because Bush told them to until Bush was safely reelected. Or the Washington Post learned that the CIA was maintaining a network of CIA black sites throughout Eastern Europe, a violation of every precept of international law and American treaties. And although they finally wrote about it, they concealed the specific nations where those black sites were located because the CIA told them that if they disclosed the nations, it would prevent them from continuing to operate those prisons. So they did withheld the information that enabled that illegal policy to continue. WikiLeaks doesn't do that. They have no allegiance to the US government. Their, their allegiance is to transparency and disclosure. And so sources know that if they disclose something to the New York Times, it's very likely that the New York Times will conceal it or will edit snippets of it and release only those to, in order to protect the interests and policies of the United States government. WikiLeaks will not have that allegiance. There is a, they have a true journalistic purpose, which is to bring transparency to the world. And then finally, what you see is the reform potential um, with WikiLeaks. The amount of information that has been released over the past year is extraordinary. 
And although journalists have talked about how there's, quote, nothing new in these documents, that was the um, claim made for a while to dismiss its importance. On the one hand, WikiLeaks was a grave threat to national security and was jeopardizing all that was good in the world. And on the other hand, nothing they were disclosing was remotely new and it was all everything that we already knew. That conflict never got reconciled. It didn't need to. But the reality is that the documents that WikiLeaks has uh, disclosed has not only made huge headlines in the United States, but in almost every country around the world. Um, and what's really interesting is that Bill Keller, the aforementioned New York Times executive editor, although a hardcore critic of WikiLeaks, in that article said that some of the documents released by WikiLeaks, allegedly disclosed to WikiLeaks by Bradley Manning, exposed just how corrupt and opulent the royal family in Tunisia was, and that that helped fuel and accelerate the uprising in Tunisia, which of course was the catalyst for the rest of the uprisings in the Middle East. And so if you look at the chat logs that have been disclosed, where Bradley Manning supposedly confessed that he was the source of these documents, what he says about why he did that was that he believed that only WikiLeaks would provide the level of disclosure needed to bring about the kind of transparency that would make people, not just in the United States, but the world, realize the level and magnitude of corruption of the people in power. And that this could not help but trigger very serious uprisings and reforms. Exactly what has happened is exactly what he said he hoped to achieve through this leak. And that's why what David said in his introduction sounds like it may be satirical or hyperbole, but I think it's really true. I've said this the same thing as well, that if Julian Assange or Bradley Manning were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, it would certainly be a far more justifiable award than the one that was given in 2009 to the American president. So I, I have one more point that I just want to make that I think underscores um, this whole controversy. And that is, I said earlier that I saw the WikiLeaks controversy as a war um, over the regime of secrecy and whether it would be preserved um, or subverted and over internet freedom as well. And you know, the people who are most threatened by WikiLeaks are well aware of the fact that you cannot stop the technology that WikiLeaks has developed. Even if you did send a drone to kill Julian Assange and everybody else associated with WikiLeaks, the template already exists. It's not all that difficult to replicate WikiLeaks's system for anonymity and for disclosure. And in fact, there are other entities already popping up that will simply substitute for WikiLeaks and replace what they're doing. So the Pentagon knows that, the national security state knows that, they know that they can't create secrecy practices that will pr protect them against these kind of disclosures as well. So their strategy is to escalate the climate of intimidation and deterrence so that would-be whistleblowers in the future think twice and a third time and a fourth time when they discover illegal and deceitful actions about exposing it to the world. And so you see, in response to WikiLeaks and a variety of other whistleblowers, the Obama administration waging what is clearly the most unprecedentedly aggressive war to prosecute whistleblowers, people who exposed waste and corruption and, and lawbreaking in the Bush era, have been prosecuted with extraordinary aggression by the Obama DOJ, even though Obama, when he ran for president, hailed whistleblowers as patriotic and courageous and said that whistleblowing needs to be fostered and protected. He's currently heading a war that likes of which we have never seen to put people who whistleblow, who expose the, power, the, the wrongdoing of the powerful into prison and to expose who they are and detect them. On top of that, you have a war being waged against WikiLeaks. The Justice Department is obsessed with the idea of prosecuting WikiLeaks, even though they've done nothing that newspapers every day also don't do, which is expose government secrets that they receive from their source. And they've done things like subpoena the Twitter accounts of anyone associated with WikiLeaks, including a sitting member of the Icelandic parliament who was once associated with WikiLeaks, causing a little mini diplomatic crisis, at least as much of a crisis as can be caused with Iceland. Um, and and you, you, you see as well, 
what ha- has happened to Bradley Manning, which David described and I've written endlessly about and won't repeat, but what they want essentially to do is to take that climate of fear that I began by talking about, that made so many people who read what I wrote petrified of donating money to WikiLeaks, even though they have the absolute legal and constitutional right to do so, and they want to take this climate of fear and drastically expand it. This is what the Bush torture and detention regime were about. Everybody knows that if you torture people, you don't get good information. It was never about that. Disappearing people and putting them into orange jumpsuits and into legal black holes and waterboarding them and freezing them and killing detainees was about signaling to the rest of the world that you cannot challenge or stand up to American power because if you do, we will respond without constraints, and there is nothing anybody can or will do about it. It was about creating a climate of repression and fear to deter any would-be dissenters or challengers to American power. And that is what this war on whistleblowing and this war on WikiLeaks is about as well. They don't want, more than anything, for anybody to get the idea that they can start doing what WikiLeaks is doing, to start exposing those in power who engage in wrongdoing. That is their biggest fear because they know that if that mechanism exists, they can no longer continue to do the things that they are doing. And so this war on WikiLeaks, this war on whistleblowers is about forever ending the really the one avenue that we've had over the past decade for learning about what our government and their corporate partners do, which is the process of whistleblowing. And if they succeed, that regime of secrecy will become much more intensified. That deterrence will endure for a long time. But if WikiLeaks is successfully defended, if these efforts are warded off, then one of the most promising means of bringing accountability and transparency that we've seen in a very long time will be preserved. And that's why I talk about WikiLeaks so much, why I write about it so much, and why I think it's so important. So thank you very much for listening. Twenty-three hours a day, uh, with very little access to uh, any other, you know, contact. And uh, now, most recently, it's been reported that he has been uh, stripped of his clothing as well. Does that echo Abu Ghraib or the founding principles of American uh, democracy? Uh, there's very good evidence that the. WikiLeaks documents, and again, Holder has been very virtuous in denouncing Julian Assange, and he, he promised to you know, look for any legal avenue to bring Assange uh, to justice, the, the uh, WikiLeaks uh, man. And so you have you know, aiding the enemy. Who is the enemy in this case? The enemy is us, the American public, because we and the people of the world have benefited from the release of these documents. So I think this issue of uh, Bradley Manning and uh, uh, Julian Assange and WikiLeaks uh, goes to the very core principles of democracy and who we are as a society. And just today, or just yesterday, uh, Obama announced that military tribunals will be resumed uh, at Guantanamo. Uh, You'll remember his campaign promise to uh, eliminate, to close down Guantanamo, promise forgotten, and we move on. Turn the page, as Obama said, uh, on Iraq in one of his most infamous uh, speeches, completely forgetting uh, international law and accountability. So just as a generation before, when Johnson and McNamara and Rusk and the others went scot-free for their war crimes, this group Bush. After this, one is Maria Hinosa uh, from Latino USA, who will be here on a- Monday, the 4th of April, with Mary Charlotte. And on April 2nd, uh, May 24th, uh, Michael Ratner, the attorney and president of the Center for Constitutional Rights. <laughs> He'll also be with Mary Charlotte. Um, Glenn Greenwald is going to be well introduced by David Barsamian, but I wanted to say about David.
um, that he's been producing alternative radio, which is carried on KOS, KONM and many, many public stations for 25 years. He's a, he's a really, um, he's an, a, a journalist and, and progressive intellectual who has probably interviewed more progressive intellectuals than anybody else in America. And uh, so we're very honored that he agreed to come and be the host of this evening. And again, thank you, all of you. You're really great. It's wonderful you're here. Here's David. Thank you. Yo. Hey, muy buenas tardes. Bienvenidos. Que viva de la Internacional de las Mujeres. Today is International Women's Day. Arriba. Well, it's wonderful to be here and to be part of this uh, exciting new series. Many thanks to the Lannan Foundation. Uh, just a couple of um, housekeeping notes uh, after uh, Glenn uh, Greenwald's presentation. There'll be a brief intermission and then there'll be uh, we are, in the words of John Adams, a nation of laws, not men and women, he should have added. And this was an insurance against the tyranny that American colonists had launched a revolution to abolish. For that reason, American political liberty was always bound to the notion of the supremacy of law over men. Then Greenwald adds, that central promise of the American founding equality before the law has been abandoned. And from the investigation and harassment of peace activists in the Midwest, um, all the way to India, where Arundhati Roy is being threatened with sedition because of her outspoken political dissent, uh, we are finding uh, numerous examples of the state clamping down on freedom of speech and flaunting the very notion of equality under law. We have now the case right in front of us of Bradley Manning, who in my view uh, should be a candidate for the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> and maybe a, a Lannan Award for cultural freedom. Now, you know, you see Eric Holder, Obama's uh, attorney general, you know, very piously and virtuously denounce uh, Bradley Manning for what he has done, leaking, um, he has not been convicted of anything, incidentally, and he's been being held now for nine months in solitary confinement, dialogue and, and audience questions, and then there'll be a book signing uh, uh, at the very end in the, in the lobby. What is justice? Is it another commodity in the marketplace to be packaged and sold to the highest bidder? These are not idle questions, but go to the core of who we are and the nature of our society. And I want to read from the introduction to um, Glenn Greenwald's forthcoming book, With Liberty and Justice for Some. <laughs> kind of gives it away, doesn't he? The central principle of America's founding the ultimate guardian of justice would be the rule of law. Vast inequality in every other realm was considered inevi inev inevitable and even desirable. Some would be rich and many would be poor. The American conception of liberty was not only consistent with but premised on the inevitability of outcome inequality. The one exception was the law. Under the law, no inequality was tolerable. Law was understood to be the political sine qua non, ensuring fairness, a level playing field, and a universal set of rules. It was the non-negotiable prerequisite that made all other forms of inequality acceptable. Only if everyone was bound in the same rules would outcome inequality be justifiable. So central is this founding principle that most Americans absorb it by osmosis. 
via, via numerous cliches we're all familiar with. All are equal before the law, justice is blind, no one is above the law, etc. We wow. <laughs> well, this is really fantastic. Uh, you're here tonight for the, for the very first uh, lecture series we're titling In Pursuit of Cultural Freedom. And and I can assure you this is just the first one. There'll be many more, particularly with this uh, reaction of the people of Santa Fe. This is just very exciting for us. And this, we're going to continue to do the readings and conversations, so that's a separate package. Um, I just want to mention some of the issues we're going to try and touch on. Uh, income distribution, economics in general, but income distribution in the United States. <laughs> Labor rights. <laughs> women's issues, women's rights. <laughs> Climate change. Civil liberties and civil rights. The militarization of our foreign policy. Educational issues. Racism and xenophobia. And immigration. And I'm sure there are others. I, I just made those notes before I put on my glasses and I can hardly read them. Heard me? Immigration, I, I mentioned that, yeah. Um, are, are, we have two lectures scheduled 